Well, as we begin, I want to offer a special greeting to our Mill Creek uh, campus. It's great to be with you today by the small miracle of simulcasting. I want to thank our great staff, uh, tech staff, for making all that work today. I also want to thank Jenny Allen for stepping in for Pastor Sterling today as he's away. And I'm glad to be here with you here at Kessinger Campus, um, pinch-hitting for Pastor Jeff as he and a bunch of other Chapel Streeters are frolicking in uh, Turkey and Greece. If I sound a little bit jealous, I am. Um, because they're in a place, a part of the world where uh, our story as believers really started, where the church really started. They're learning a lot there. We'd rather have them back in the next couple of weeks or so. But a number of years ago, can you guys hear that? I'm getting a weird, like a spaceship is landing. Okay. A number of years ago, back when Chapel Street uh, was just one campus, South Street, some of you may remember those days, uh, we were serving at that time as a polling place for a local election. I think we still do that from time to time here at this campus. So that meant the lobby was full of voting machines and registration tables and a whole lot of people from the community that weren't part of our Chapel Street family. Uh, and so I had to walk through the lobby at one point, and as I did, a gentleman called out to me and said, hey, are you the pastor here? And I said, uh, yes, sir, I am. And he kind of nodded over his shoulder to where the sanctuary was, and he said, so what are you doing in there? And I said, excuse me? He said, on Sunday morning, there's cars all over the place. I want to know what you're doing in there. And, and at the time, we were having some parking issues. Um, it was our only campus, and we were having to shuttle people and to make sure they didn't park on people's lawns in front of their driveways and stuff. So I thought maybe someone had parked near his driveway, so I started to apologize. Oh, I'm sorry if we go here. He said, no, 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 nothing like that, no problem. I'm just amazed you can get so many people to come out to church on a Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. That was our earliest service at the time. So I'm wondering, what are you doing in there? So I was relieved, and I said something like, Oh, well, we worship God, we love people, and we do the best we can to teach his word. And he seemed a little surprised and maybe a little disappointed, like he thought we were doing something really weird or, or like giving away timeshares or something. Um, but that's what we're still doing as a church all these years later, only on four campuses. We're trying to worship God, love people, and teach his word the best we can. And, and that's the way we say it now is that we want people, everyone, to experience grace grow in faith, and make an impact right where they are. And that's essentially what the Apostle Paul has been teaching us over these last eight weeks now in the series we're calling Colossians, the Fullness of God. And like Paige said, today we wrap it up in our ninth week, and I want to begin uh, with the verses that Pastor Jeff has urged us to try to commit to memory over these couple of months. I'm gonna, here's the way I want to do it. I'm going to put the, just a part of it on the screen, um, and I left some words out. I want you to help me fill in the words as we go to see how well you're doing, okay? So say it with me out loud. Here we go. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things. Oh, you didn't sound very confident in the last one. In him all things hold together. Okay, I can report to Pastor Jeff, you did a pretty good job there. Well, Paul has walked us through some, some really deep theological waters in this letter. He's talked about who Jesus is, about what he's done, who we are in him, and what it means to have the fullness of Christ dwelling in us. And then what that looks like in the central relationships of our lives, in marriage, in family, and in work. And now he comes to his final thoughts in this letter. I'm going to read to you the rest of the letter, part of it now and part of it later. Colossians 4, beginning in verse 2. Paul writes, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I'm gonna stop there for now. We're gonna see here Paul leaves uh, his brothers and sisters 
in Colossae, brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae, people he's never visited, but people he loves. He leaves them with three encouragements. We're going to cover the first two right now. Be faithful in prayer and be faithful in witness. The third we'll add a little bit later. First, he says, be faithful in prayer. Now, most of you know, if you've been around Chapel Street for a number of years, that uh, my dad um, was a pastor, so I grew up in the church. But you may not know that for a period of time at one of his churches, our family actually lived in the church building. Here's a picture of Hillside Church, uh, about 40 miles north of New York City, as it looked in the late 1960s. You'll see that part to the right there with the two little dormers? That was the parsonage where the pastor's family lived. So we lived in that part of the building, and that was separated from the sanctuary, the rest of the church, by a small hallway and my dad's office. So it didn't take my younger brother Joe and me very long to discover that there was a closet in the upstairs of the parsonage area that was directly over the sanctuary. And in that closet, there was a knot hole in the floor that we could look through and see straight down into the sanctuary. So on Wednesday evenings, when um, the church always had prayer meeting, when a small group of people would gather to pray for about an hour, we would, and we, we didn't have to go, my parents would go, so we were alone, and we would go up to this closet and peer through that little knot hole and spy on, so we called it spying on, the people during prayer meeting. But that wasn't terribly exciting because they were just praying. So we needed something to make it a little more fun. So we started making little tiny paper wads. <laughs> and we were, we were dropping them through the knot hole, trying to get them to spiral down and land on the back of the lady's hair who, was, who were praying down there. And we, we did that. Uh, and so <laughs> our fun didn't last very long, though, because it didn't take the FBI to figure out who had access to that part of the building. And I like to say that when my father found out what we were doing, my brother and I had our own little prayer meeting because we were in trouble. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So Paul here is saying some simple but very important things about prayer. He's saying that prayer matters. It matters, so continue in it. Now, I, I, I have to admit that, that I don't really understand fully how prayer works. I don't understand fully how, how it works. I just know God invites us to do it. Um, I call it the spiritual technology of God. I have another technology in my pocket all the time. I guess you do too. I don't understand how this technology works either, but I use it pretty steadfastly. My guess is you do as well. Paul says, Use steadfastly prayer as the technology of God. He's also acknowledging, I think, that prayer is, is hard for us. It takes steadfast effort. It takes perseverance. Last week, we were given these little student missions prayer cards. Remind us to continue steadfastly in prayer for our students and our leaders as they travel this summer. Keep that so it reminds you to keep on praying. And then he says, be watchful in it. He means here to stay awake, to be alert, to pay attention to what's going on around you. Remember, they were dealing with false teaching and people were being confused by these other teachers. He says, be alert, pay attention, put that in your prayer. He wants you to, be, to pay attention to what's happening inside you as well. It might be temptation or it might be discouragement. Those become part of how we pray. He says, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Seven times in this one letter, at least once in every chapter, Paul encourages the Colossian believers to be thankful or to offer thanksgiving in their prayers. So prayer is persistence. It takes effort and perseverance. It's filled with gratitude. And we see Paul model this earlier in the letter. Colossians chapter one, Paul writes, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. In verse 9, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So Paul says we are to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful and thankful, but what specifically does he want them to pray for? What specifically are we to pray for? Now, before I go on, let me remind you of where Paul is as he writes this letter. You remember? 
He's in prison in Rome, chained 24-7 to an armed Roman guard or soldier. So he's writing a letter that's going to be delivered by hand to the church in Colossae, which was, which was many, many miles away, and then hopefully delivered uh, in a circuit to all the regional churches in that area. So what would you imagine he might ask all of these brothers and sisters to pray for? Anyone? Right. Get me out of here. Get me out of prison so I can do the work I was called to do, to travel and plant churches and preach the gospel. But that's not what he says. Verse 3. At the same time, he says, pray also for us, what? That God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Paul does not say, pray that God will open the doors of this prison. So I can get out of here because it's uncomfortable. No, he says, pray that God may open a door for us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. So Paul's in prison, chained to a Roman guard. What kind of open door could he possibly be talking about? If we jump ahead to the letter he wrote to the church in Philippi that we call Philippians, written about a year or so after the letter to the Colossians, here's what we read. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It sounds like to me that prayer was answered. For Paul, a door was open, but where was the open door? You notice? In prison. To the whole palace guard, he says. He's talking about all those armed Roman guards who were chained to him, one after the other, 24-7. Can you imagine being a Roman and being a pagan, and you're chained to the apostle Paul for 24 hours a day? You have no chance, Right? The guy's talking about Jesus. He's getting to know you. He's praying for you out loud. What are you going to do? Some of those guys were coming to faith. That's what Paul is saying. And he says to everyone else, those are other prisoners. And then he says to brothers and sisters, the small struggling community of believers in Rome is being emboldened. And they're getting stronger because of Paul's testimony in prison. It's amazing. We didn't invent the idea of making an impact where you are. We say that often here, to grow in faith, make an impact where you are. We didn't invent that. The Apostle Paul did. Where was Paul? In prison. Where was the open door? In prison. Where was his impact? In prison. So it makes me ask the question, where do you live today? Where is your neighborhood? Where do you go to school? Uh, where's your dorm room? Where do you work? Where do you stop for coffee every day or every week? Pray for an open door where you are, where you live. Paul says, pray for an open door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, that is, who Jesus is, what he's done, and how we can live in him. That's what he's proclaiming. And then Paul says, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Let me ask you, does that hit anyone as kind of funny for Paul to say? It's me as, as being funny. I mean, this is the Apostle Paul we're talking about. Thir we have a full 13 books of our New Testament came from Paul's pen. So do we think, you know, he's a little fuzzy about the gospel? A little fuzzy about the details? No. A brilliant mind. So what does he mean by, help me be clear, pray for me that I can be clear? I think that maybe Paul knew that sometimes he could be a little hard for everyday people to understand. Peter thought so. In his letter, he said, you know, Paul can be kind of under, hard to understand. Maybe he knew that sometimes he could overwhelm people with his intellect. Maybe he knew that sometimes he could be kind of argumentative and tough. So here he says, pray for me that I can be clear. He wants people just to understand who Christ is. And he asked them to be faithful in prayer. Second thing he says here is be faithful in witness. Be faithful in witness. I did not... 
uh, originally go to a Christian college. I went to Davidson College in North Carolina, had a Presbyterian background, but was no longer a Christian really. And by about a week into my freshman year, I fully realized that I wasn't in Kansas anymore. Um, you can hang on a second on that. Okay, come back. I don't want you to look too much at that picture until I show you. Okay. Um, so about a weekend, I had seen and heard things that were new for me and would have made my parents shocked. Uh, but, but if you ask me after a week, I would have said that there wasn't a single other guy on those 27 guys on my floor, now you can put it up, who was, were also believers. I would have thought not a single guy. Um, now I know there were a few guys, but none of them were, were bold enough. They were like me. They weren't really um, sharing what they were, that they were people of faith because he just wasn't cool. Um, we're going to play a little uh, game here. Can you, can you play find Brian in the picture? Do you see where I am there? Okay, look all the way to the right side. There I am. <laughs> what? That, that was a cool coat back then. I got my basketball, my... So that's me there. Um, so about, one night about a week into to that freshman year, we're hanging around in the dorm room after midnight, just, you know, hanging out like college guys do. And out of nowhere, one guy who I'd already identified as least likely to have ever been to church in his life, pipes up and says, hey, coffee, what makes you tick? I still remember his name. It was Banks Robinson. He was right in the middle of that picture, standing next to the big giant bottle. Um, <laughs> I said, uh, what do you mean? He said, we've been here a week now, and you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't curse. What makes you tick? And I realized, even though I'd been trying to be private about it, I'd been outed as a follower of Jesus. And I had to say something. All the guys were sitting right there. What was I going to say? And I kind of mumbled through something like, well, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, so... Uh, and to this day, I'm embarrassed I didn't have a little better answer than that. Paul says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. I'm going to come back to these. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to, you ought to answer each person. By outsiders, Paul means those who are not yet followers of Jesus, those who are not part of the church family. Perhaps they don't know anything about the gospel, like those Roman soldiers. Maybe they uh, had an incomplete or kind of twisted version of what the gospel was. Many people in our culture are like that, I think. They have, kind of have an idea, but it's kind of twisted. It's not really full, fleshed out. Um, but maybe they follow a different religion, a pagan religion. But notice he says, walk in wisdom, and then this really interesting word here, toward outsiders. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. I think sometimes as followers of Jesus, we are sort of conditioned to do the opposite, you know, to avoid people who don't believe like we believe, to avoid people that, that might ridicule or might even be hostile toward the church or the faith, like we're afraid to be, that we'll be intimidated or maybe even contaminated by, by them and their lives. Now we do need to turn away from certain behaviors and certain attitudes. But Paul says, walk toward the people, walk toward outsiders. He's saying it's not just about what we do in here, it's about what we do out there. So what does it look like? I think it means to go out of your way, to have lunch with a coworker that you don't know. Go out of your way to have lunch with a fellow student that you don't know. Get to know the people who work in your regular coffee shop. Walk your neighborhood. Be curious about people and their stories. Ask them about their tattoos. I started doing that recently. My brother encouraged me to do that. If you see a tattoo that's visible, say, hey, that's interesting. That must have a story behind it. They'll look at you kind of surprised, but it's there, you know, so ask them. And they'll, you'll find that some of them are about pain. Some of them are about hope. Some of them are about identity. You'd be surprised the spiritual conversation you get into just by asking people about their, about their ink. He says, we walk in wisdom when we move toward outsiders with gracious speech, he says. Our words must be full of grace. The great word there is charis. It's God's undeserved favor. In this case, it means to speak with words that are attractive and winsome. I've told stories about my dad before, but uh, he loved to memorize scripture. He was a pastor for like 60 years. At one point in his life, he had over 100 chapters of the Bible memorized, not verses, chapters, all right? He tells a story about one time going through a checkout line in a store, 
He got to the lady at the register and she was just crestfallen. Uh, she was, her eyes were full of tears uh, and evidently some customer, a couple ahead of my dad had, had been very rude to her. And when my dad got there, total stranger to her, she said, please say something nice. My dad launched into Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. And that woman's face just melted into a smile. And she said, that was beautiful. Say something else. <laughs> Had I been there, I would have said, whoa, you don't know what you're asking for. That's what Paul's talking about. He says our words are to be seasoned with salt. In other words, to be gracious and also tasty. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So faith in Jesus makes us salty, but the salt has to get out of the shaker. And then he says that we may know how to answer everyone. I wonder if you, like me, paid attention at all to the Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma women's softball team this past week. Did you see the story about them? Well, let me fill you in. Uh, they won the national championship for collegiate softball for the third year in a row. In fact, this year they went 61 and one. They won 53 games in a row. And at the, at the championship press conference, there were three athletes at the podium and a reporter from ESPN asked them, You've had the pressure of being the number one team in, this, in the country all season long. How do you deal with that kind of pressure? How do you keep the joy of playing? And star shortstop Grace Lyons answered, the only way you can have a joy that doesn't fade away is from the Lord. Softball can't give you that. And then three-time All-American Jada Coleman said, we won the College World Series when I was a freshman and I was happy to win, but I didn't feel joy. I didn't know what to do the next day or the next week. I didn't feel filled. I had to find Christ in that. We want to win, but if we lose, it's not the end of the world because our life is in Christ, and that's what matters. Go back and, and Google search it. Just Oklahoma softball players. All three of those young women gave just beautiful, gracious statements of faith about their identity in Christ, and that's what Paul's talking about. The last thing I notice here is making the best use of time. When Paul says that, he's not talking about time management. Uh, he says literally in the Greek, redeeming the time. And the word for time is kairos. There were two words, chronos, which meant chronological time, like four in the afternoon. Kairos was a different kind of time. It meant the meaning of something that happens in chronological time, like a moment or an opportunity, like the moment of time when you propose marriage, like the moment of time when a child is born into this world, or the moment when some says, someone says to you, coffee, what makes you tick? Redeeming the opportunities that God provides. And back for a moment to that night in that, ho that college dorm so long ago, I mumbled a rather weak answer, but then some 25 years later, I was reading in my alumni uh, magazine, looking at class notes, and I saw that guy's name, again, I reckon, Banks Robinson. Huh, wonder what Banks is up to. And what it said was, his daughter had recently returned from a mission trip that she took with her church youth group. I went, who knew? Now, it wasn't my feeble answer that did that. Somewhere, someone along the line gave a much clearer answer to Banks Robinson. And I actually looked him up on Facebook. He's an elder in his church today. Who knows? Be faithful in witness. Thirdly, Faithful in service. Be faithful in service. Let me read the rest of Paul's letter. You stick with me through this. Verse 7. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that's taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin, cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. 
Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in, in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you. And for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Now that last verse, verse 18, is interesting. There's evidence from other parts of the New Testament that late in his life, Paul struggled with his eyesight. So he was dictating this letter, someone else who was writing it down, maybe another prisoner. But right at the end, he wants them to make sure they know it's from him. So he grabs a pen and he writes that final greeting in his own hand, likely in very large letters that he could see. And he just says, remember my chains, pray for me, and remember that sometimes chains are part of the whole deal. Sometimes suffering comes with sharing the good news. And then he says, grace be with you. Now, when I first looked at the end of this passage, um, I was just going to skip over this part of it and just do the first part. I mean, it's just a list of names. But the more I looked at the names, the more significant it seemed. So stick with me here. Paul mentions 11 people by name. Tychicus. He's mentioned several times in the New Testament. We know he sometimes traveled with Paul, but we don't have any evidence that he ever preached or ever taught, or ever planted the church, but we know that Paul trusted him. He delivered money to the struggling church in Jerusalem. He delivered three letters by hand to communities that became three books in our New Testament, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon. So we know that he trusted Tychicus, and so he calls him beloved brother, faithful minister, fellow servant. Onesimus, we learn later in the book of Philemon, he was a runaway slave, which was a, 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 a great violation of the culture of the time. He was in trouble, but he became a follower of Jesus. And now he's headed back to where he'd run away from, and Paul wants him received as a faithful and beloved brother. Paul then mentions three men who he says are of the circumcision. That means just means of Jewish background, as Paul is. Aristarchus, who had traveled with Paul and had been arrested with him, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, with whom Paul had a falling out, a serious conflict sometime before, but now they've reconciled, and he may have been in Rome visiting Peter, who may have been in prison at the very same time as Rome. And Mark became the author of the gospel according to Mark. Justice, also called Jesus, we know nothing about him. Only place he shows up, just that he was a fellow worker in the kingdom of God Epaphras, you remember from chapter 1, was probably the founder and pastor of the church in Colossae. He's gone to Rome to ask Paul's help in dealing with all these false teachings that are happening around their city. Paul calls him servant of Christ. Luke, the beloved physician, traveled with Paul, stayed with him all the way till the end of his life, and wrote the gospel according to Luke and all of the book of Acts. And then there's Demas. Here we see that Demas was once close to Paul, but later in one of Paul's very last letters, 2 Timothy, he says that Demas has deserted him because he loved the world. Then Paul mentions a woman named Nympha, only time she's mentioned in the whole New Testament, and she evidently was an affluent woman with a home large enough for a church to meet in it. And finally, in verse 17, a guy named Archippus, who evidently was a young man struggling with follow-through, and Paul sort of gives him a pep talk. Fulfill the ministry you receive from the Lord. So all this is fascinating to me and ought to be astonishing to you. Here's why. We only have 13 letters of Paul's in the New Testament. 13 letters. And we believe every single word of every single letter is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Paul give, devotes a whole paragraph to 11 names that 2,000 years later we read as the Word of God. We have to ask why. Why devote that much real estate, precious real estate, in the New Testament to 11 names? Well, here's what I see. Some of those names were faithful fellow servants of Christ, just faithful, trustworthy, Tychicus, Epaphras, Aristarchus. Some went on to be giants of the faith, Mark, Luke, some we know almost nothing about, Justice and Nympha. 
One fell away and completely abandoned the mission, maybe abandoned the Lord, Demas. And one was struggling with obedience, Archippus. So here's what I think. These were real people living real lives in a real place facing real issues. In other words, they're just like us. We are in the letter to the Colossians. We're in this letter. Paul understood that the Christian life was not meant to be lived alone. He understood that ministry and ministry leadership could not be accomplished alone, even for Paul. Paul understood that the survival and growth of the church depended on faithful people. People who were faithful in prayer, people who were faithful in witness, people who were faithful in service, right where they were. And so it strikes me that we are their direct descendants today. Because we are the church here, right where we are. And the story of the church is still being written. And we are part of that story. And when it is written, our names will be in the story. And what will be said of us? We have the mystery of Christ, the mystery and beauty of Christ. We are chosen, holy, beloved. We have the fullness of Christ dwelling in us. What will be said of us? May it be faithful in prayer, faithful in witness, and faithful in service right where we are. Bow with me as we close. Lord, thank you today for your word, for this letter written so long ago, but could have been written last week to us. And by your spirit, it is for us. We are your church. Just as the Colossians were your church in the first century, we are chosen, holy, dearly loved. Your fullness dwells in us by faith. May we be faithful to our identity, to our calling, faithful in prayer, faithful in witness faithful in service, right where we are. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You want a three-word summary for the entire book of Colossians? There it is. Jesus, you alone. Our benediction today comes from Colossians chapter 3. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him.